So it is officially June, and June is LGBTQ Pride Month. And for a number of reasons, Pride this year is essentially not happening in a sort of public way. Right. But it has made me really think about what it means to be an ally. Yeah. Because we would not enjoy any rights at all as gay people without the allies that helped us along the way. Right. Particularly other marginalized groups, particularly people of color. Right. We would not be anywhere. We have rights as gay people because of black trans women and queer folks who that night at Stonewall said no. Yeah. We can literally point back to history to show us that. Yeah. The Stonewall riots, which were riots. I mean, five days of like almost a week of like riots and looting and insanity. Now it is the moment that we celebrate as the beginning of a movement and is the, you know, the start of what became like affording rights to LGBTQ people. Right. It is that spark that lit the flame to bring forth change. The change didn't happen immediately. The change was hard fought, but the change did come. And those rights have been afforded to us because of that night that really began a lot of things for a lot of people. So allyship is an incredibly important part of the LGBTQ community. In fact, it's LGBTQI. AA, and the last A is for allyship. Mm-hmm. Um, and those allies are those people among us that stand with us, stand for us, and and help. What does allyship mean to you? I mean, I think allyship is someone who, uh, be, someone that's an ally is someone that has your back, um, has your best interests at heart, is willing to fight for you tooth and nail, um, and is willing to do what needs to be done to help, if you're talking individually, to help you as a person. If it's an ally in a greater sense, I feel like it's someone that is willing to do those things, but for on a much larger scale for a group of people or for a movement. I think being an ally also means showing up and not being afraid to show up and to show up in many ways. Um, It means, I think, also to show up even in moments when you were not with those people that you're an ally for, Mm -hmm. right? Right. Like in those conversations around dinner tables where people can't speak for themselves, in those conversations in public spaces, back when we could have conversations in public spaces, when there are people there who can't speak for themselves, Right. right? You must show up for them and be their voice when they are not present. Like that is what an ally is for me. And that is what I feel like Any person that I consider an ally in my life, to me personally, that is how they've shown me to be an ally. Mm -hmm. So yeah, showing up and doing the work so that you have the dialogue and that you have the temperament in order to like speak directly to someone who may be uninformed and may be misinformed. It's tough, but that's the work. And to not doing that work and opting out of that work is we're now in a place where that is part of the problem. Right. If you've chosen, you know, to not do that work and if you've chosen to remain silent, then, you know, paraphrasing a quote by Desmond Tutu, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. That's right. Silence is not the answer right now. No, no, no. Silence doesn't make action happen. No. At least not in America. During LGBTQ plus Pride Month here at Gaze at the National Parks, we like to turn our trail mixes into Pride mixes. That's right. The National Park Service back in 2016 released their LGBTQ theme study, which was in an effort to tell all American stories, they did a lot of research and work to identify places and people whose stories preserve LGBTQ plus heritage and culture. And so they have done a lot of work on making sure that those stories are more visible. We also want to help make some of those stories visible, which is what we do here at Pride Mix. Today is all about Bayard Rustin. 
Bayard Rustin was an incredibly brilliant strategist and pacifist and a forward-thinking civil rights leader during the middle of the 20th century. He was someone that planned the journey of reconciliation, which would be used as a model for the freedom rides of the 1960s. He was a mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was someone that introduced nonviolent civil resistance to him through the work that he had studied of Gandhi. He was someone that worked in the deep shadows of the civil rights movement because he was a closeted gay man and he was not trying to hide that. That also was an issue because he was also someone that was very briefly affiliated with the Communist Party. And unfortunately, if it was found out or widespread, it could unravel the work that he was doing and the work of the civil rights movement. He was born in 1912 in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and he was raised with Quaker values, which, as he says, are based on the concept of a single human family and the belief that all members of the family are equal. He attended many colleges. He attended Wilberforce University, Cheney State Teachers College, and City College of New York. While he was in New York, he got a job actually singing as a spiritual singer in nightclubs, and that is how he made a living. He became very active in protests against racial segregation, particularly when it came to the United States Armed Forces. And for this reason, he was flagged by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI, which was relatively new at the time. He took an interest in the Communist Party briefly, but he quit the Communist Party uh, after they ordered him to stop his protesting. So he said, no, thank you. I'm not interested in this. And he left the Communist Party. Um, Or he, you know, stopped. I guess he stopped going to the meetings. He was known as a lifelong pacifist And that is perhaps because of his Quaker upbringing. But he quickly, as a young person, was committed to civil and human rights, so much so that that led him to many protests. Because he participated in protests, he was arrested multiple times and he went to jail twice. He, in the 1940s, met A. Philip Randolph, and he worked with him on a bunch of different proposed marches to Washington, D.C., which were to protest segregation in the armed forces and the defense industry, which was important at the time. Remember, the 40s, you know, were still in the throes of World War II. This is an important time for America to try to work to bounce back from the Depression. So there was a lot of like military industrial complex happening in order to create material for war. Part of these marches on Washington, D.C. were to try to advocate for desegregation in the armed forces because you do have people of color that are fighting in their own units in World War II and also desegregation in the defense industry. Um, So the production of goods and materials for the war. President Roosevelt at the time was incredibly alarmed of the specter of violence and negative publicity during this war against fascism in Europe, that a deal was reached before a march could even begin. So basically, there was, you know, some sort of deal that was achieved that allowed this to the the marches, the protests to be quelled. That left Rustin disappointed. In 1941, that march on Washington was called off. And he then joined the pacifist reverend A.J. Must's Fellowship of Reconciliation, which is also known as F.O.R., And they launched the Congress of Racial Equality in 1942. Rustin, again, was a lifelong pacifist. And that didn't prevent him from traveling the country to speak out. In 1944, he was arrested for failing to appear before his draft board and refused alternative service as a conscientious objector. Again, lifelong pacifist. He's not interested in fighting. He's not interested in violence. And so he was sentenced for three years because of this. He only served 26 months, which angered authorities because of his constant um, desegregation protests and his open homosexuality. So they actually ended up transferring him to a higher security prison because of this. All right. So now let's talk about Irene Morgan. Okay, Irene Morgan was a black woman who got on a bus on July 16th, 1944. It was a Greyhound bus in Gloucester County, Virginia. And she was 
headed to a doctor's appointment in Baltimore, Maryland. It was a five-hour ride that went between two states. She was sitting in the colored section. As the bus got fuller, the bus driver asked her to move further back into the colored section. And she said no. She was already sitting in the colored section. And at the time, bus drivers had the same power as the police officer. So the bus driver drove the bus all the way to the jail in Saluda. Then a sheriff came out and um, got onto the bus. He handed her the order that said she was being arrested. She tore it up and she threw it out the window. Then they got into a giant fight. She fought back and uh, they did eventually take her and jail her. Then she went to court about this. And this is when the NAACP got involved. Okay. And when she went to court, she, um, well, she says, quote, about the officer, he touched me. That's when I kicked him in a very bad place. He hobbled off and then another one came on. He was trying to put his hands on me to get me off. I was going to bite him, but he was dirty. So I clawed him instead. I ripped his shirt and we were both pulling at each other. He said he'd use this nightstick. And I said, well, we'll whip each other. So she went to jail and then when she went to court uh she did plead guilty to resisting arrest because that's why they arrested her right and she paid the 100 hundred dollar fine for that but she pleaded not guilty to the second charge which was violating virginia's segregation laws and that was because she was on an interstate bus so does the state segregation laws apply to a bus that is driving out of state is essentially the question that now we're facing. Okay. She was convicted and fined $10 for that, and she refused to pay that $10. And literally, that brought her case all the way to the Supreme Court. Wow. And so her lawyers argued that forcing passengers to change seats every time you cross a state line, it was an undue burden on commerce. Essentially, after, you know, a long time fighting this, the Supreme Court agreed with them. And this is what the Supreme Court said. As no state law can reach beyond its own border, nor bar transportation of passengers across its boundaries, diverse seating requirements for the races and interstate journeys result. As there is no federal act dealing with the separation of races and interstate transportation. We must decide the validity of this Virginia statute on the challenge that it interferes with commerce as a matter of balance between the exercise of the local police power and the need for national uniformity in the regulations for interstate travel. It seems clear to us that seating arrangements for the different races in interstate motor travel require a single uniform rule to promote and protect national travel. Consequently, we hold the Virginia statute in controversy invalid. So her lawyer, whose name is Spotswood Robinson III, he was like, I can't argue that the entire law is unconstitutional because it won't. I can't make a success here. Mm Mm-hmm. But I can make a success if I go at it from this angle, which he did, and she won. So this inspired what were the Freedom Rides. The first one included Bayard Rustin, and it was called the Journey of Reconciliation. And so what they did was they got nine black people and nine white people to get on buses that were traveling across many states to see if the buses would follow the order of the Supreme Court. You can read more about all of this if you research the freedom rights. In this first journey of reconciliation, many of them were arrested because they were not. They they did not follow the statute from the Supreme Court. Because this was commonplace all the time. Right. I mean, if we look at... The Little Rock Nine, who after like the Supreme Court said, okay, we're everything, like you must integrate your schools. Mm -hmm. They showed up to go to school for many days within a single month. And every time they were turned away. Right. Because it was the Supreme Court can throw down a decision, but then it's like, oh, well, is local law enforcement going to enforce the decision? Right. Right. So that's sort of what we're getting into. Because of this journey of reconciliation, Baird Rustin was arrested 
And this was, he spent 30 days on a chain gang, as well as many other white people and black people that were arrested for the same reason. Later in 1956, at the advice of the labor leader and activist A. Philip Randolph, uh, Rustin travels to Alabama to lend support to Dr. King um, and the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, and this was many years later. Right. This is many years later. Which, the journey of reconciliation is in 1947. This is nine years later in 1956. To bring up other people involved with bus boycotts, right. I would like to also mention Claudette Colvin, who was the teenager. Rosa Parks obviously got gets the most sort of attention for what she did when it came to the bus boycotts. Mm-hmm. Claudette Colvin down south at least started this. Okay. And Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks knew each other, were part of the same NAACP chapter. Um, So Rustin remained out of the spotlight during this time when he was working with Dr. King, but he was there to kind of like mentor King, especially when it came to the teachings of Gandhi, nonviolent protest or nonviolent opposition. While working with Dr. King, he helped him to organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1956 and through 1957. He was also at this period of time working to demonstrate against the French government's nuclear testing program in North Africa. Again, his goal was to make sure that no human life expires or as he puts it i want no human being to die this was like an important ethos of bayard rustin rustin was on the fbi's radar for quite some time because he was someone that was deemed an agitator by the fbi um, because of his affiliation with the communist party but in 1960 the fbi is not Baird Rustin's problem. It's actually um, another black leader, Representative Adam Clayton Powell Jr. of New York. He was someone that was angry at the fact that Rustin and Martin Luther King Jr. were planning a march outside the Democratic National Convention in Los Angeles. He planned to blackmail King and Rustin, saying that they were, in fact, gay lovers, which would have completely undermined much of the work that was being done at the time. So this was a particularly low period for King. He essentially put distance between himself and Rustin, and Rustin reluctantly resigned from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Apparently, according to James Baldwin, for that, King lost much of his moral credit in the eyes of the young, which is a direct quote from Baldwin in Harper's Magazine. Um, Rustin was incredibly popular with the youth of the movement. So now we get into... um... Another major moment in the civil rights movement, Bayard Rustin started working with A. Philip Randolph on the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. This was sparked by an event in May of 1963 when Birmingham, Alabama police under the commissioner Bull Connor turned fire hoses and attack dogs on black children. This kick-started the Kennedy administration to start action on a civil rights bill, but this also sparked Martin Luther King to look at national mobilization. Rustin was actually the one that led the coalition called the Big Six Civil Rights Organizations. We have the SNCC, which is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We have CORE, which is the Congress of Racial Equality. We have the SCLC, which is the Southern Christian Leadership Council, the National Urban League, and the NAACP, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and Randolph's Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. While Bayard Rustin was the one coordinating all of this, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP he said that it would be important to not have Rustin as the face of the Big Six Coalition because he was, quote, a person of liabilities, which is code for he is openly gay and we can't publicly have this as the face of our movement. Sure. I think that and also the fact that he was associated with the Communist Party for a little that while too. definitely was a strike against him in the eyes of you know, many for him to be the the figurehead or the front person for the big six. 
there are a lot of problems with trying to kind of like ensure that this march for a uh, march on Washington for jobs and freedom went off without a hitch. Um, part of those included uniting civil rights leaders that were feuding, fending off Southern segregationists to oppose civil rights, and fending off opposition from Northern liberals who advocated for a more cautious approach to civil rights. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Ooh. I'm giggling at the idea of a more cautious approach. Right. Okay, great, um, you guys. So, you know, this was, this was something that there were a lot of things to contend with, with making sure that this all happened well. During this time, you know, even though Rustin is, you know, not the figurehead and not like the front person for this anymore, he's still working behind the scenes and working in the shadows to plan things, as as is quoted from some of the sources that we're using. He feared interference from Washington police and from the FBI, but it actually came from the Senate floor, which three weeks before the kickoff for this, our longest living senator, you know, that is no longer with us, Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, attacked Rustin personally. Rustin was a gay ex-communist, and this was something that made him an easy target, which is, again, why they didn't want him to be, you know, the front man for this. Part of the issues also were the practicality of getting people to Washington. People had to know how to get there. There is an organizing manual that Rustin and his team distributed from New York. It's 12 pages, and it basically ran like the gamut of what was practical about getting there to the philosophical to the political. Part of the that manual was a section that's titled What We Demand, And Rustin and his team were concrete in laying out the march's 10 goals. One, a comprehensive and effective civil rights legislation from the present Congress without compromise or filibuster to guarantee all Americans access to all public accommodations, decent housing, adequate and integrated education, and the right to vote. Two, withholding of federal funds from all programs in which discrimination exists. Three, desegregation of all school districts in 1963. Four, enforcement of the 14th Amendment, reducing congressional representation of states where citizens are disenfranchised. Five, a new executive order banning discrimination in all housing supported by federal funds. Six, authority for the Attorney General to institute injunctive suits when any constitutional right is violated. Seven, a massive federal program to train and place all unemployed workers, Negro and white, on meaningful and dignified jobs at decent wages. Eight, a National Minimum Wage Act that will give all Americans a decent standard of living. Government surveys show that anything less than $2 an hour fails to do this. Nine, a broadened Fair Labor Standards Act to include all areas of employment which are presently excluded. And 10, a Federally Fair Employment Practices Act, barring discrimination by federal, state, and municipal governments and by employers, contractors, employment agencies, and trade unions. Sounds like some of those things are things that we can still work on to this very day. Yeah, let's just let that land right there. The March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom had somewhere between 200 and 300,000 people. There were many speakers, including Mrs. Medgar Evers, uh, John Lewis, Dr. King, and Bayard Rustin is the one that read the March's demands. After the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, uh, the leaders of the Big Six met with President Kennedy. And uh, as it seems, Rustin was not in any of the photographs, but that he was nearby for all of these moments, but he was just never publicly photographed in any of them. Despite the tensions with other Black activists and leaders, he Rustin remained engaged with the struggle for justice. When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, Rustin participated in the Memorial March. He also, you know, was someone that moved beyond just working in the United States. He started to focus in on international causes, including offering support to Israel, promoting free elections in Central America and Africa, and aiding refugees um, as vice chairman of the International Rescue Committee. So during the 1980s, Rustin also opened back up about his sexuality, which he had not been as vocal about since the 1950s. And part of that became uh, more present because he had fallen in love with a man by the name of Walter Nagel. 
1987, in an interview with The Village Voice, Rustin said the following, I think the gay community has a moral obligation to do whatever is possible to encourage more and more gays to come out of the closet. For his part, um, Rustin worked to bring the AIDS crisis to the attention of the NAACP. Bayard Rustin died on August 24th, 1987. Uh, just four days shy of the uh, March on Washington's uh, for Jobs and Freedom's 24th anniversary. His residence is now uh, preserved by the National Park Service. It is called the Bayard Rustin Residence. In 1977, uh, Bayard's partner, Walter Nagel, moved into the apartment. Uh, and Nagel continues to live there, preserving the apartment almost exactly as it was when, uh, as Rustin had left it. And on November 20th, 2013, Bayer Rustin was awarded the Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama, as well as Sally Ride and Walter Nagel, as well as Tam O'Shaughnessy, were the first LGBT partners to accept that award for their late partners. Rather than ending this trail mix with a game, we're going to end it with two quotes by Bayard Rustin. When an individual is protesting society's refusal to acknowledge his dignity as a human being, his very act of protest confers dignity on him. First, what is the dynamic idea of our time? It is the quest for human dignity expressed in many ways. Self-determination, freedom from bigotry, and equality of opportunity. If we want human dignity above all else, we cannot get it while we are on our knees. We cannot get it if we are running away. We cannot get it if we are indifferent and unconcerned. This has been Pride Mix by Gays at the National Parks. And we're here to remind you to pride early and pride often and that resilience is always out there. Gays at the National Parks was created and is hosted by Dustin Ballard and Michael Ryan. To see images from this episode, follow our Instagram at Gays at the National Parks. To email us, contact us at Gays at the National Parks at gmail.com. And to find out more about the parks spoken about on the show, visit our website, gaze at the national parks.com and that's gaze g-a-z-e all original artwork featured on instagram and on our website is by michael ryan all original music was written by dave seaman and performed by dave seaman mariella Klinger, and sean scleos our music producer is skylar fortgang this episode was edited by dustin ballard <laughs>